Um, okay, so let me start. In Italo uh, Calvino's luminous tale, Invisible Cities, there is the last exchange in the book between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, in which Marco Polo has been uh, describing some 55 cities in the Great Khan's empire. The Great Khan's atlas contains also the maps of the promised lands visited and thought, but not yet discovered or founded, New Atlantis, Utopia, the City of the Sun, Oceana, Tomoe, New Harmony, New Lanark, Icaria. Kublai asked Marco, you who go about exploring and who see signs can tell me toward which of these futures the favoring winds are driving us. So Kublai asks, what does the future hold? Which imagination of the city or our world can we expect? And I believe that this symposium also asks this question. Who can we expect, what can we expect in the future, and what can we anticipate? And Marco replies, for these ports I could not draw a route on the map or set a date for the landing. At times all I need is a brief glimpse and, uh, and opening in the midst of an incongruous landscape. A glint of light in the fog, a dialogue of two passengers by meeting in the crowd. And I think that setting out from there, I will put together piece by piece the perfect city made of fragments mixed with the rest, of instants separated by intervals, of signals one sends out, not knowing who receives them. If I tell you that the city toward which my journey tends is discontinuous in space and time, now scattered, now condensed, you must not believe the search for it can stop. Perhaps while we speak, it is rising scattered within the confines of your empire. You can hunt for it, but only in the way I have said. Marco Polo has suggested here a speculative process or method for imagining the perfect city, the utopia, or at least, perhaps, the city hoped for, a place, perhaps, of peace and social justice, tolerance, care, and freedom. Such a city, such a home is imagined, and thus invisible. The speculative process, he suggests, is to gather glimpses and glints, scattered fragments, discontinuous and condensed, and though illusory, as Marco insists, we must not believe the search can stop. Like Marco Polo, we must travel both in our minds and intellects, but also, also in fact and in truth, accompanying other travelers and asking, what are people doing when they travel, when they migrate, when they immigrate, when they are forced in to re refuge and exile? What is the labor of their bodies doing? Why do they do this? And what do they do when they settle and congregate? And as for the host and receiving folks, what are their needs and why? What sort of exchange and encounter is happening or can happen? I grew up in LA. This is my home. My parents lived in uh, Los Angeles, or they moved uh, to Los Angeles from San Francisco and Oakland in the 1950s. And uh, we first lived on Fifth Avenue, a block from Jefferson. It was the center of, of an African American and a Japanese American community. My father was the pastor of a Japanese American church near Normandy and Jefferson Boulevards, and his neighbor, and this neighborhood was the original center of a pre-war Japanese American community. In the 1950s, young Nisei returned from concentration camps in the desert to jumpstart their new lives, to put to the past behind them and to start families and to become part of a post-war American century and to produce their, produce their own American baby boomers. For Japanese Americans returning to Los Angeles to particular neighborhoods like central LA was not a choice. It was one of the very few options in a racially segregated city governed by covenants. My family was part of a convergence of migrations in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl migrations from the American prairies 
and the great migration of African Americans from the South, encouraged to work in California for the war industries, that opened to their labor because of FDR's wartime executive order prohibiting racial discrimination in federally sponsored industries. Then the immigration of Asians, Chinese and Filipinos, including uh, my Meiji Restoration grandparents, that's my grandmother over there, and uh, Mexican migrations that favored and rejected their labor in successive ways. What I was very much aware of as a child, although I didn't understand it as such, was the upper mobility of others who were able to move out of our neighborhood to nicer homes and better schools. The incremental nature of these changes that would completely revamp our old neighborhood uh, and the way in which the color map of Los Angeles would move across streets and boulevards encompass cultural and class changes that I could see in my lifetime. By the time my family moved to the West Side Crenshaw District, I knew that the riots happening in Watts was over there, nearer to my old home and my old friends. And by the time my family moved to Gardena, an old Japanese strawberry and flower growing farmland area churned into suburbs, it seemed natural and obvious to me that the mayor of Gardena would be a Nisei man who had pioneered a real estate business in Gardena. Eventually, I would leave to study in Minnesota, in Tokyo, and finally in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, in the 1970s. And I lived in Brazil for almost a decade. But in 1984, I returned with my Brazilian family and immigrated back into my own country. And what struck me about the Los Angeles that I rejoined was that it was not the same place that I had left. Not the LA of my childhood. It was not a black and white town with Mexicans living on the east side and Hollywood in the hills. It had become what statisticians had predicted it would become, a Hispanic city, a Latin American city. And my Brazilian family seemed to belong there. The change in LA had happened not because of an earthquake or any disaster, but because of a radical but gradual change in its population. So what follows here is uh, a new geography of my old neighborhood. Um, and I'll read a little bit. Buzz Worm studied the map. Balboa turned it out, uh, torn it out of a book for him to read, Court City, or some such title. He followed the thick lines on the map, showing the territorial standings of Crips versus Bloods, old map, 1972. He shook his head, even if it were true, even if it were true, whose territory was it, anyway? He remembered years ago neighborhood meeting at the old uh, recreation center. City bureaucrats come over to explain about how they were going to widen the freeway, move some houses over appropriate streets, buy out the people in the way. Some woman, just like grandma, stood up and wanted to know what the master plan was. How'd she know it wasn't going to be more than just widen the freeway? How'd she know it wasn't going to be more than one map, was one ramp? Wasn't going to be some other surprises, an airport maybe, condominiums and hotels and convention halls. Who was going to guarantee that she was going to have a place to live under the master plan? Bureaucrats unveiled their poster boards and scale models, everything in pastels, modern life. Made the hood look cleaned up quick. Made the palm trees look decorative. This was a plan, just a little freeway widening, wasn't going to affect her house. Her house was her house, wasn't going to affect her. Bureaucrats acted like she was crazy, paranoid, but they knew better. Anything can happen. Time and paper on their side. By the time the freeway could be widened, people forget what they got promised. Politicians who promised could be gone. Situations change, bureaucrats don't. So they said it wasn't going to affect her. They be around to make sure. Make sure it took five years to clear out the houses. Make sure the houses left to be broken into and tagged. 
Let the houses be there for everyone to see, used for illegal purposes. Pass drugs, house homeless, make sure the ramp took another five years. Slow down the foot traffic and the flow, break down the overpass crossing the freeway, make it impossible for people to pass. Stop people from using the shops that used to be convenient. Stop people from coming to her dress shop, used to be a respectable shop. Anybody who's anybody, she did it, custom hot code tour. Entire wedding lineups now. Homeless, dope dealers, prostitutes, only ones passing her shop. No master plan, no man. Wasn't gonna affect her, no way. Was no wonder you could make a map, call it all gang territory. Was no wonder homies tagging their territory. They wanted it all back, claim it for the hood. Futile gestures without a master plan. Leave it crumbling and abandoned enough. Nothing left for the bulldozers. Just plow it away, take it all away for free. Today he was doing the rounds with the street peddlers. They had their unspoken territories too. He never saw them get in fights about it. They were very civilized about territory. Plenty of corners to go around, plenty of freeway ramps. El Norte was big, LA was big, Grande C. Si. He had these conversations all the time. Get your business license, see, fill this out, put it on the paper, La Opinion will do. A few were old timers, but most moved on. It was too risky if you didn't have documents. Margarita, what's on sale today? Everything on sale, otherwise going to rot. This is not so good today, Margarita smiled. She always smiled, even when business was not so good, even though she got her boys out of El Salvador to escape the Mano Blanca death squad, and now they're banging in El LA with the Mara Salvatrucha. I'll take a bag of peanuts. Senor Buzzworth, you always take peanuts. I'm an elephant for peanuts. Take bananas, they're gonna rot, she forced him a bunch. What's the music today, she pointed at the Walkman in his ears. For you, Margarita Oldies, Aretha Franklin. How'd you know? I know, I know you listen to mariachi también. Los camperos, the very best. Sorry, she shook her head. It's not my culture, I, Salvador. Yes, he pointed at her, Aretha Franklin, don't be such a purist. She laughed. Look, I got nice oranges. This, uh, not the season, see, but imported from Florida. Not on hers, he nodded. But he thought he'd better set Margarita straight. If it's Florida, it's not imported. Same country, see. If it's Mexico, it's imported. Por qué? Florida's more far away than Mexico. When I returned from Brazil, I started to think about the literature of L.A. And I learned that L.A. literature was significantly classified as detective noir, associated with Raymond Carver and Ross MacDonald, uh, that it was, for example, the dirty realism of John Fonte and Charles Bukowski, and the literary journalism of John Didion. And I learned that the history of sucking water out of the desert into this urban desert was a dark and sinister history retold in Hollywood films like Chinatown and Robert uh, Roger Rabbit and stylized in Sunset Boulevard and Pulp Fiction. But what I felt was missing from this literature were an entire populations of colored people who seem to have been written out of this history. So one of the reasons for writing The Tropic of Orange was in response to my own question, where were the people I knew in my city? And further, why is it that authors and narrators could ride the freeways, but they never encounter the people in it? Why were the hard-boiled dicks marginalized, drunken, fallen white men who happened to be able to navigate colored ghetto marginal spaces like Harlem and Chinatown? Um, that is, why couldn't we navigate and represent our own spaces? And why did the freeway system allow one to escape poverty by driving above it while trapping others within it, giving LA up into forgotten and segregated districts? When the next riot occurred in 1992, what happened and what did we learn? Why did the two kings, Martin Luther Jr. and Rodney, sit symbolically side by side in that year 
And did this mean that civil rights movement had changed nothing? In these years, urban architects were speaking and writing about LA and its urban sprawl. And I was fascinated by this writing because I had also lived in Tokyo and in Sao Paulo and uh, even greater urban monsters. Um, uh, but they were different but similar. But in all three of these locations, there seemed to me to be a kind of, um, what I'd say, a nostalgia for the future. Or what the Brazilians would call saudades para o futuro. Related, I believe, to the architecture of Oscar Niemeyer and the conception and social recreation of the capital of Brasilia. And I wanted to capture that future with, if not the real people, the recognizable folks that I knew also lived in my city of LA. Now, The Tropic was written uh, in the early 90s, and it was finally published in 1997. So it's a really old book. Um, and it's over 15 years old, and um, I, I didn't want to talk about it today. But I didn't, I realized I had to do this. Uh, uh, so, and I thought, oh, they want me to talk about Blade Runner or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I just read a new book, your new book, Hyper Cities, Thick Mapping and Digital Humanities. And it, it occurred to me that Everything I imagined 15 years ago is now kind of real. <sighs> um, and I've been sometimes asked if I would revise this book um, and updated stories. And if somebody wants to do it, be my guest. <laughs> um, uh, and I thought that it might be useful uh, to you, if you want to do this, to tell you how I wrote it. Um, besides, it occurred to me that for the purposes of the symposium, which is in part searching for methodologies and pedagogies, making transparent the creative process to this particular book might be useful. Um, so I've been trying to, for months to figure out why or what I should be doing in, in this conference and among so many scholars and academics um, and, um, whose work is more precisely situated in urban studies and planning and theorizing. And so here I am, this fiction writer, pulling from a dozen disciplines to create stories, lies, fiction, speculations from collective anxieties, intuitions, and so I apologize. The original short story uh, was simply titled The Orange, and it was about a laborer from the South who finds an orange fall into the ground near the Tropic of Cancer um, outside Mazatlan, and he takes that orange along on his journey north. And as it happens, the Tropic of Cancer, um, that invisible line, is threaded through the orange, and thus the laborer drags the Tropic of Cancer and everything south of it across the border into LA. Um, so that's the narrative arc of the short story. So, okay. So this is what you get. I'm gonna read for it to again to me. The bus broke down, the engine blew up, the pistons imploded, the diesel ran down out of a rusty hole in the tank and only minutes from the border. They all got out of the bus and uh, looked. Our Arkanhel opened his dusty suitcase and pulled out the steel cables and hooks. He was never without them. One never knew when they might be useful. And this was the second incident this week to prove his theory. Sol was jumping on the seats, pressing his nose into the windows and making faces. He peered into the suitcase and selected the orange from Arkanhel's assortment of toys. Arkanhel closed the suitcase and set the boy on top. Stay right here, he commanded gently. Sol pressed the orange to his nose, then shook it up and down. Good, good. Once again, Arkanhel offered his services to pull the buck bus, slipping the steel cables uh, through the axle and hooking his old skin through the metal talons. And once again, the people scoffed at his efforts and gawked amazed as the bus inched slowly along the highway, harnessed to an old man's leathery person, skin pulled taut across his bony chest and empty stomach, minute droplets of blood kissing the earth. 
dragging everything forward, it was as the burden of gigantic wings too heavy to fly. Such a commotion aroused that no one noticed either on one side or the other of the great border that Arkhangel and a broken bus and a boy and an orange and for that matter everything else south were about to cross it, the very hemline of the Tropic of Cancer and the great skirts of its relentless geography. The thing called the New World Border waited for him with the anticipation of five centuries, admittedly a strange one, but conquistador of the north he was. Ah, he thought, the north of my dreams. South of his dreams it had been a long journey. He could remember everything. Here was a mere moment of passage. As he approached, he could hear the chant of the border over and over again. Catch him and throw him back. Catch him and throw him back. Catch him and throw him back. It was the beginning of the north of his dream, but they questioned him anyway. They held the border to his throat like a great knife. What is your name? Cristobal Colón. How old are you? Quinientos y algunos años. When were you born? Doce de octubre de mil cuatrocientos noventa y dos. Where were you born? In el nuevo mundo. That would make you post-Columbian. You don't look post-Columbian. What is your business here? I suppose you would call me a messenger. And what is your message? No news is good news. <laughs> is that a question? Say, do you speak English? Yes. Where did you learn to speak English? At Harvard University. <laughs> So you studied in the U.S. Where? At Harvard, at the School of Business. I was there at the same time as Carlos Salinas. Then at Stanford University in economics with Fernando Enrique Cardoso. Also at Columbia University with Fidel Castro. I did my thesis in political theory there, you see. And finally at Annapolis. What I studied there is a secret. Where is your visa, your passport? Were you not expecting me? You had better consult your State Department and not to mention the side agreements with labor and the environment. I am expected. Me estan esperando. He moved forward, slipping across as if from one dimension to another, and the words came immediately. Speak English now. The first wave came like a great flood behind him, showing their hands at the borders, ten working fingers times thousands, having to show their fingers meant that they must enter with nothing in their hands, nothing but their hats on to shade their foreheads, the sweat on their backs, the seeds in their pockets, the children in their wombs, the songs in their throats, the cockroach, the cockroach, the cockroach. Customs officials chased after Arcanhel. By the way, are you carrying any fresh fruit or vegetables? Arcanhel yelled behind him, only three years of corn and one lousy orange. Now I wanted to turn the arc of that story of the traveling orange into a novel. Uh, with characters that I saw missing from contemporary LA literature at the time. And while I was, while also demonstrating the transformation of LA that seemed obvious to me. And at the time, I was working as a secretary at KCET Channel 28. Remember that thing? Uh, well, it's still around, but it's no longer PBS. But when I worked there, it was a PBS station. Um, and now the building is actually owned by Scientologists. Do you know that? So <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Just okay. I'm not talking about that. Um, so I was driving daily up the Harbor Freeway from Gardena, where I lived, to Hollywood to work, and thus my intimacy with the freeway was daily, and my knowledge of television, satellite dishes, TV production, HGTV, analog and digital technologies was growing. Um, simply because I worked in the engineering section of this television station, and I wrote memos for engineers who could fix a TV or a transponder or a complex camera system, but they couldn't write about it. Right? And by the way, the transition from the electric typewriter to the computer happened during this time. That's how old I am. 
Um, so very gradually, I learned word processing on a computer. And one day, my boss asked me to learn something called Lotus. You know what Lotus is? Excel now. OK, so that I could keep accounting for the department. So I learned Lotus, and what I discovered was that Lotus was a spreadsheet software. Um, it, it, it would confine text to a column. And this was so amazing to me. Uh, and most importantly, I learned how to create windows, so that in between working for the engineering department, where you can see, it's windowing. Um, so I windowed into my Lotus worksheet, and um, I put in seven characters down one side. I don't know if you can see this, um, but those are the seven characters of this book. Um, and I put seven days across the top, and pretty much that was the map for my novel. Um, and basically, I had seven days to get the orange uh, from the Tropic of Cancer in Mazatlan to L.A. And then there were seven characters, and seven times seven means there were 49 chapters. Uh, through which I had to tell the story. And attached to seven characters were seven literary genres, and the seven narrative voices, and varied attributes, and metaphors, and sensibility about time, geography, and history. So, and each of these characters uh, represented um, uh, a point of view and a narrative voice and genre um, reflective of the city. So, Rafaela Cortez uh, is one character. She's a satire of magical realism. Bobby New is an immigrant flaneur on the street. He's a capitalist, working class guy. Um, then there's Emmy, who's a bitchy Asian television producer, kind of me, um, who envisions life as perpetually mediated through television. And then there is Busman. A buzzworm who is an African-American social worker obsessed with time and palm trees. And finally, uh, oh, oh, not finally, but Mazinar Murakami is an old homeless Japanese-American who is traumatized by his wartime incarceration and conducts orchestral music from the Harbor Freeway overpass. Yeah. Um, Gabriel uh, Balboa, he's a Chicano journalist who performs the hard-boiled detective on the beat. And Arkanhel, who is a performance artist, just read about him, um, and Labor is a border crosser and poet. He's traveling to Atlante. So all of these characters made their entrance into the book as stereotypes and caricatures, and they assume racial perceptions of the reader, but they also assume the narrative voices and literary, literary genres that accompany those stereotypes. So this Lotus. Um, spreadsheet became something I called the hyper context of the novel and was for me a navigational page. Um, like the LA cityscape or, you know, remember the Thomas guy? I don't even know what that is. I just, I don't feel so. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I discovered in each of the characters um, or their narrative voices a kind of narrative scape which led to me to think about other scapes. So there are cyberscape, infoscape, timescape, soundscape, performance scape, borderscape, datascape, and uh, narrative scape. Um, in other words, this broad urban scape of LA, which then became transformed, abstracted, imagined, and visibly invisible. And also, there were layers built beneath this gridded mapscape. Um, as in the detritus of history in one place at, 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 um, at the same time. Um, but also geographic layers that spoke through the earth. And I found as a writer my relationship to geography and to space and to history were thus transformed. And um, creating layers um, uh, over this map like grid placed multiple ideas and images in juxtaposition and recreating and re-envisioning the complications of the urban. Um, you know, so you now I got really kind of crazy. Um, so um, so as, as the character Manzanar Murakami notes in the book, he says, there are maps, and there are maps, and there are maps, and there are maps. So in this, this scene, this is one of the last scenes, uh, Emmy, who is that bitchy news producer, um, 
is following the action news of the Harbor Freeway, which has literally been taken over by the homeless in Ben's story. And she's been suntanning herself on the top of a news truck, um, and she's hit by a stray bullet. So Buzzworm, um, the African-American social worker, rescues her and drives <coughs> the truck out of the melee. Buzzworm wove the van through the droves of screaming and panic-stricken people like so many walk-ons, avoiding the sudden car explosions and shattering glass, careening around the digitally constructed dismembering of cats and dogs and even a horse. A cast of thousands, military and civilian, ran this way and that in an epic disaster. Emmy looked on with dull approval. It was being fair. The explosions could be extended, the ride sped up, the sensation of violence and speed intensified. Strange, but she could actually smell the gasoline and smoke. Her eyes teared uncontrollably. The van's rear tire blew and Buzzworm forced the thumping vehicle to up the side of the freeway valley heading instinctively for some palm trees swaying against the wind of helicopter wings in a camouflage of smoke. Stray bullets hailed from above as he crouched through the ivy, cradling Emmy, and slipped with her between that tight constellation of palms. It was strangely and suddenly peaceful there. Emmy pulled a bloody hand up to her face and stared. I give you permission not to touch my blood, she said. I tested negative, but you never know. Buzzworm held her close. He knew a dead cookie when he saw one. And he smiled. Who'd have thought you and I'd get this close? She might have embraced him, but her limbs had ceased to feel. About all she could do was to look deeply into his eyes and flutter her lashes. If we can just all get along, maybe all our problems will go away. Going to take more than holding hands to start that revolution. Oh well. And he blew it off. For Gabe, did you try the net? Baby sister, you know I don't know nothing about that. Gabe's into the net. Ever since he saved that village, he's been devoted to online. Buzzworm looked around, wondering if the net could save anyone from the current situation. In the smoke, he could see the military in jungle camouflage, making its move down the freeway canyon. The live monitors didn't notice this, didn't show this. It was too busy repeating the beginning of the end ad nauseum. Being the hero of the footage, he looked to her as the heroine. Finally, her death would be unforgivable. Emmy's enraged media would see to that. A thousand homeless could die, but no one would forget her ultimate sacrifice. She continued, last I looked, Hollywood wants to buy the rights to the guerrilla war in the Chiapas. Why even go that far? Tell Gabe I got lucky and went to the big sleep. She pouted for effect. Did you see it? What? The big sleep. There's a chauffeur who dies. See, his car gets pulled off the Santa Monica Pier. Suddenly, they stop the action. Someone asked the question, who killed him? Script continuity, see? Nobody knows. They call up Raymond Chandler. He doesn't know either. Gabe told me this, so it's all hearsay anyway. But it's like that. Like what? The big sleep. Just because you get to the end doesn't mean you know what happened. Oh, Buzzworm wasn't going to push it. Didn't matter. She just rambled on anyway. Hey, I read there's some guy digitizing LA, gonna put this treacherous desert outpost online. Maybe the big sleep is just a big digital wet dream, and life is just a commercial break. Maybe Gabe can call me up in cyber, and we can do it in my sleep. She grinned and gasped, interactive life. I'm not going to remember to tell Bobo something I don't even understand. Can't you keep your message simple? Uh, how about this? I just want to know one thing. What color is blood in black and white? It dribbled down in a thick vein over her lips. Buzzworm noted it would most likely be black. 
But he said, it's all shades of gray, baby sister, shades of gray. Annie's voice sank into a whisper, abort, retry, ignore, fail. Okay, I'd say I'm a dumb writer, and that is to say that I'm almost uh, most often writing to figure out a question, uh, which I cannot unravel without writing. Um, many of the questions of the symposium are questions that I grapple with in trying to write this book uh, about the authority and privilege of any map, about databases, information as a kind of intoxication and overload, and whether this overloaded database could in fact provide you with the information you really need to solve problems, about the social construction and engineering of public spaces, um, and about what architecture makes you do and think, and how it creates living spaces and organizes our lives. And all of this came about because I needed to find a practical structure to write while at work, which also would address the layers and multiple intersections I found missing or erased from the city in which I had grown up. I don't think literature will save us from the predictably and comparably short Anthropocene era that humans will eventually live out. But perhaps there are ways through narrative and storytelling and creative processes that may open other paths. When I wrote The Tropic in the 90s, I didn't know any genre called the speculative to name what I was doing. And lately, there are writers working on the speculative um, or aspects of science fiction and fantasy to try to capture the anxieties of our current concerns about globalization, climate change, environmental devastation, ethnic wars, conflicts, human epidemics. And lately, uh, we've seen everything from zombie globalization and Godzilla traversing the Pacific to destroy San Francisco. And perhaps the tropic, as it was described, um, at describing the reality of all cosmopolitan Pacific Rim LA, was an early example of how speculative can represent or subvert um, representations of the urban. Octavia Butler was an earlier writer of <clears throat> the genre of science fiction and fantasy and race who wrote on LA. Uh, another wonderful writer, the speculative in immigration as it plays out in East LA is Sashu Foster. And then there's Chang Ray Lee who has written a book based on a vision of the city of Baltimore um, connected, um, connecting a polluted China to a post-apocalyptic And to be honest, for this writer, the projection, the process of writing any book is a speculative, creative process, and it joins characters and stories to questions, um, or a series of questions, perhaps to say that all writing is speculative. Um, but I don't mean to say that there are not categories of speculative as defined by literary critics and theorists, um, and I accept those uh, definitions. Um, Karen Joy Fowler, who's a speculative writer, told me what I'm doing is slipstream, and I don't know what that is. But I'm ignorant about that, and I think um, probably my work is closer to um, Latin American affinities, um, such as Borges, Cortaza, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and Eduardo Galeano. And also Brazilian writers, uh, such as uh, Mario Andrade, and his seminal work, Macunaima and to Oswaldo de Andrade and his manifesto, Anthropophagia. And very lately, I've noticed that there is urban writing that is close to the realism of photography and memoir and the work of W.G. Zabel. Works by Tejun Cole and Valeria Luiselli that would not be named speculative by any means, and yet whose speculations about human memory and perception very much match a global urban world and erudite philosophical questions and thought processes about ideological isms that now permeate speculations of the urban. Calvino published um, his book, Invisible Cities, in 1972. 42 years later, perhaps we can now speak of invisible planets or the urban earth. For after all, they say Marco Polo was always speaking of one city only, and that was uh, Venice, in which we recognize all cities, all locations, 
human and social interactions. Um, and now upon this narrative net of invisible planet, many planets, many maps of our planet may be drawn. Not just of empire and national boundaries, but those maps of satellites and surveillance, of ideology and poverty, of military war operations, of the movement of labor and the traffic of human beings, and of our food and uh, resources, uh, of climate and the death of living species. At the very end of the conversation between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, the story continues. Already the great Khan was leafing through the atlas over the maps of cities that menace in nightmares and malediction. Enoch, Babylon, Yahulan, Butua, brave new world. He said, it is all useless if the last landing place can only be the infernal city, and it is there that, in ever narrowing circles, the current is drawing us. <coughs> so even the great Khan despairs the future. And Polo said, the inferno of the living is not something that will be. If there is one, it is what is already here, the inferno where we live every day, that we form by being together. There are two ways to escape suffering it. The first is easy for many, accept the inferno and become such a part of it that you no longer see it. The second is risky and demands constant vigilance and apprehension. Seek and learn to recognize who and what in the midst of the inferno are not inferno and make them endure, give them space. <laughs>